Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Marianne Hensley and I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing here at Freight Waves. I am super excited to be here with you all. And if you were on the line on Monday, we do apologize for the technical difficulty due to some construction that was going on in the area. As you may or may not know, Freight Waves will be launching the first ever Trucking Freight Futures contracts in the coming months. And so today is really designed to be an educational session about what futures contracts are, how they can help reduce volatility in the freight markets, and how they'll impact the industry. And I am super stoked to be here with our CEO and founder, Craig Fuller, um, who's going to be providing the presentation today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit those through the Q&A button in your Zoom control panel. And if you have questions or technical issues, please use the chat function to reach out or to communicate with one another throughout the presentation. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Craig. Good afternoon, Marianne. Thanks for uh, having me back uh, here today to talk about Freight Futures. Uh, I want to reiterate uh, the apology that we had on uh, Monday, or Tuesday it was, when we had the uh, construction in the area. Uh, today, uh, we we you know, shouldn't have those problems, and we're going to dive into freight futures. We're excited. Unfortunately, Danny Gomez, uh, our partner at Nodal, uh, had prior obligations with his family and could not attend this particular call. Uh, so I will be diving into some of the uh, context that he he will be providing. But I think we're ready and prepared. So today's agenda is to dive through just an introduction on uh, the freight futures market, talk a little bit about the market size and opportunity, uh, talk about trucking freight futures and an overview of it, provide some use case examples, how you or participants in the market can get access to trucking freight futures, and then talk about an additional training opportunity we have coming up on November 14th in Grapevine, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas uh, and it's hosted uh, and coincides with our Market Waves conference uh, that we also have at the Gaylord Texan. Uh, a little bit about, about my my background. Um, I have been around trucking my whole life. Um, I did grow up in a family of truckers. Uh, had this idea about two and a half years ago to start a freight futures uh, business based on trucking uh, and have since then gone out and built freight waves uh, to provide the uh, the, the, the information and the education uh, about freight futures. And we'll talk about how we fit into the overall ecosystem here in a second. So really excited to be here and thank you for joining. Um, a, a little bit about the partnership. One of the things that's very important to understand about freight futures markets is that to have an effective large and liquid market, you need a whole ecosystem. These, these businesses or these uh, futures markets are not typically one company doing all the work. It actually takes a village, as they say. Um, what we have done is sourced out firms that we think are best in class and can contribute to the most likelihood of success in terms of freight futures and provide the most value to the marketplace. Our partners in this venture are Nodal Exchange, which was uh, last year bought by Deutsche Borsa's EEX Exchange. And we'll talk about a little bit about Nodal. Um, DAT, which if you're in trucking, is, is probably a household name for you. Uh, if you're not in trucking, uh, they are the benchmark index of the U.S. trucking market and uh, provide price assessment services uh, for U.S. trucking spot rates. And we'll talk a little bit about DAT and their role. Uh, and then, of course, Freight Waves and what we do, we'll talk about how we fit into this partnership. Those are the three firms that are a part of the core partnership as it relates to futures, and there's a broader ecosystem which we'll dive to in a second. Um, so a little bit about Nodal. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's unlikely a household name, but the reason that we chose Nodal was really came down to two reasons. One is Nodal uh, back in 2009 was a cold start futures exchange, and there's just, unlike a lot of businesses, there just aren't a lot of those. They're heavily regulated. Uh, they're very expensive to sort of uh, come up and, and peer up a market. Uh, and so there's a limited number of futures exchanges. And so we went out and did a bake off of multiple exchanges, had a lot of conversations and settled on Nodal, uh, frankly, because we thought they were the best fit for this uh, futures contract. One is we wanted an exchange that had uh, built an organic marketplace, had gone out and had gone from a cold start exchange to something substantial. We also wanted executive sponsorship. We wanted to make sure that the executive team, the senior management team 
uh, related to uh, uh, related to the uh, exchange was going to be involved in the build out of the trucking futures market. And th and I would say this about Nodal is that Nodal has uh, the CEO on down uh, has been involved in the uh, uh, construction of this market that we'll be launching, and we're very excited. And the other part about Nodal that we're particularly excited about is the fact that. A uh, nodal exchange trades about a third of the power U.S. power market, and so uh, their exchange is responsible for both clearing and exchange services uh, in the U.S. power. I like the power market a lot as an analogy to trucking, and the reason I like it is that power is capacity constrained. There's only a finite number of power plants uh, in the United States at any moment in time. Similar to trucking, there's only a, a finite amount of trucking assets. Um, so it's capacity constrained. The second thing about power is it travels on geographical nodes, which is how Nodal got their name, but it travels through geographical corridors. Freight is very similar in that regard. And so we felt that the similarities of what's had happened to the power market, plus having executive sponsorship from Nodal would be important to create the liquidity of the market. Um, a little bit more about Nodal. Nodal is a regulated uh, exchange by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, they also are a CFTC derivatives clearing organization, which means in-house we have both the exchange and the clearing. Uh, it's important that you uh, you have those parties uh, intersected to to ensure that the market is liquid and all parties are working together. Uh, and so we're very excited about our partnership with Nodal, and we think that they're the right partner. Um, about DAT, for those that aren't in trucking, uh, DAT is the benchmark uh, uh, price assessment service in the trucking spot market, assessing about $57 billion of trucking freight on an annual basis. Um, they have created the benchmark price index. They're constantly referenced in media, not only freightways, but in uh, uh, media outlets that range from the Wall Street Journal to Bloomberg to just the multitude of outlets, industry included. Uh, and because of that, we think that they're the most recognized name and the most uh, uh, referenced name. And that's important when you are looking for credibility of the futures market. It's also important when you look at uh, which company is going to be most viable long term. Uh, DAT is a uh, wholly owned subsidiary of Roper Industries, which is a $30 billion market cap company. Uh, and because of that, we not only believe that DAT has the reference price, but they're also going to be in the market long term. Uh, and be around for decades to come. Uh, Freightwaves, uh, this is the business that I run. Uh, where we fit, we're the largest media outlet uh, based in uh, transportation and freight uh, on a global basis. Uh, we get about a million uh, and a half page views a month on our website, uh, on our, our organic website, uh, freightwaves.com. Uh, we also have recently syndicated content through sites like Benzinga, Bard Chart. And now we're on 72 uh, international, domestic and international business and stock news and futures news sites, uh, which is really important as we go to market because that education, that, that information is going to be critical to build out and construct a futures market. So a little bit about the market opportunity and the size of the US trucking futures market. So these markets tend to have a multiple of the underlying market, but um, what is not obvious to people, I've gone out and had this conversation over the last couple of years, uh, just how big trucking is. Because I think it, it, it's astounding that it's a huge market, but no one's ever traded futures on it. And so uh, I think a, a lot of questions come out as to why, and we'll get into that in a second. But more importantly, the U.S. trucking market is massive. It's 30% bigger than oil, natural gas, and coal combined. It's about twice the size of the agricultural, forestry, and fisheries markets, um, about two and a half times the size of the power market. And so you think about that, those are all markets that have substantial futures markets built for them to help de-risk and provide price discovery in those markets. And yet trucking, even bigger, being bigger, doesn't currently have a futures market. And that's really the opportunity that we're uh, helping to, uh, to construct. Um, the other thing to know about trucking is that 84% of the products that are transported across the United States, surface uh, transportation, this includes rail, uh, but what happens in rail impacts truck and vice versa. 84% uh, of those products are actually uh, commodities where futures are traded against them. So energy being the largest, agriculture, about 25% of freight uh, per, on a per uh, ton basis, per mile ton, is agriculture related, metals, wood, 
Um, all, there's a substantial amount of freight that moves through the United States supply chain that's actually people can de-risk uh, through futures contracts, the cost of goods sold. And so we like these types of, uh, when we think about who are the likely traders of futures, it's also businesses that have uh, already have a high correlation and already trade uh, in the futures markets. And so we think of the early adopters as companies that are exposed uh, or have exposure, natural exposure to energy and ag, metals and wood, because they already understand the constructs of the futures market. Uh, trucking, uh, another thing that I think surprises people, not the truckers on the phone, but certainly people that are not familiar with freight, is that trucking is the largest mode uh, in terms of miles and, and, and just percent of the industry. It's also the fastest growing mode. Um, and so truck to the trucking industry is growing slightly faster than US GDP. And that will continue to accelerate as we go through uh, the next decade as things like last mile delivery and e-commerce sort of take hold. Uh, trucking is going to be with us and is gonna be a core part of our US economy. Um, so to create a futures market, you need a couple of things that have to take place. And one of it is you need a large market. We'll talk about, we've talked about how big the U.S. trucking market is. The other thing that you need is a volatile market. You need volatility. And volatility, volatility is not the friend of the industry because of the havoc it wreaks on cash flow, but it is the friend of speculators. And so speculators look for volatility because volatility it gives them the opportunity to trade in and trade out. It also uh, suggests that things are improperly priced uh, or priced based on current market conditions. And so um, we look at markets that are volatile, uh, that tends to attract trading uh, uh, volume. Uh, trucking is one of those markets that has substantial volatility. So since 2014, since January 2014, trucking spot rates are up 40%, but in addition to just the upward momentum, if it was one direction, that would be less interesting. It's the volatility itself. It's the upward and downward movement of trucking spot rates that are going to create the necessary uh, uh, interest in the futures market. The thing to know about that is, while that's good for a trader and speculator, it's not desirable for either a shipper that's trying to control budgets and manage budgets. It's not ideal for an asset-based truck load carrier who's trying to manage their cash flows manage their forecast and, and also figure out how they're gonna, what they're gonna pay their drivers, how they're going to price their freight. And so the idea of futures markets is it will mitigate the exposure that uh, participants will have to volatility. So one of the things I've, I've, I've been asked quite a bit by both, and this is really practically everybody has asked this question that has uh, ever sort of heard our uh, conversation about futures is, this is great, Craig, but what makes you guys so smart that you can do this, and why now? And why hasn't it been done before? And I think it comes down to these fundamental issues, is that up until 2012, we really didn't have the ubiquity of telematics. We didn't have the ability to see capacity across the marketplace. And without telematics and smartphones, it's very hard to get real-time price discovery. So that's sort of the first development that's taken place, is this idea that technology sort of evolved to a point where we now can understand where capacity is at. The second thing that's happened is we've, we're going from an environment of on-premise to cloud computer systems, which means that the data itself is no longer held entirely in a trucking company's AS400. It's also interconnected where trucking companies and freight brokers and shippers are starting to share information among each other with benchmark services such as DAT, uh, with other uh, uh, data services. And with that, we were able to get not only price discovery, but also fundamental economic data. And with that data and with the real-time price discovery, those are the things that you need to, to construct a futures market. And so we're sort of at a point where the technology has evolved such that you have a natural opportunity to actually create a futures market. Because the most important thing to keep in mind is, when we're talking about futures, we're not talking about a physically settled futures contract. And I, I, I apologize, I didn't mention that earlier on, uh, but it's very important when we talk about futures as it relates to trucking futures, is that a truck will never, under any circumstances, show up. 
When you're trading a futures contract in the trucking futures market that we're rolling out, there isn't a physical truck to ever bump the dot. It just doesn't exist. You're not buying capacity from a truckload carrier, nor is a trucking company selling you capacity. These are financially settled contracts, which means basically what you're trading is price, and financially settled means that you are making a transactional um, uh, uh, bet on the direction of price. That's effectively the best way to think of it. And the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, in addition to the interconnected systems and the fact that we've had this ability to have technology, is that you have market forces that are also uh, enhancing uh, the you know, sort of forcing uh, the, the moment where companies are trying to de-risk their exposure to trucking spot rates. Uh, EL, the ELD mandate gets a lot of attention, and rightfully so, because it's, it's sort of uh, restricted capacity. Uh, not only is it provided a data flow uh, and provided information, but it's also restricted the amount of hours that we have in the marketplace. And that restriction has created volatility, both upward and downward volatility, and it's created a market where there is a finite number of uh, amount of capacity. The second thing to keep in mind is we have an element of labor shortage. When the economy is really, really, really strong, as we've seen this year, it's very hard for trucking companies to get drivers. That labor shortage creates a lot of upward price pressure on the U.S. trucking market. Also, what happens is when the economy starts to fall down and starts to falter, we go into more of a recessionary environment, you end up having more people join the trucking industry uh, because it's a job that is universally needed regardless of the uh, economic cycle. And so what ends up happening is we have this really upward thrust that happens in tight capacity and this really violent thrust that happens when the market loosens because of that labor shortage and availability. Um, of course, we'd be remiss and freight if we didn't mention the impact of e-commerce and what I would call the Amazon impact, the idea that I can get freight I can get a product delivered to me within an hour in some markets and, and certainly next day in most, uh, and just the overall capacity crunch. So transportation was sort of an afterthought a couple of years back in terms of how people manage supply chains. It's now among, if not the most important decision companies make about how they interact with their customers, is how do they get their product there and what's the experience look like, look like. Because of that, that's created a lot of pressure on companies' budgets because they can no longer sacrifice the mode of traffic or delay freight because the cost was too high. One of the things that's also happened this year, really uh, the backdrop of everything I mentioned is certainly playing out in the economy, is that over 40% of the S&P 500 uh, companies on conference calls had mentioned freight as one of the most substantial risks to their earnings. And, and I think it's consistently, uh, it seems like weekly, a major shipper will come out and talk about how their revenues were great because of just the overall economy, but they missed their earnings forecast because of the price pressure they had related to just shipping costs, transportation costs. So what creates volatility? I, I think the, the trucking audience will certainly recognize this. Uh, the broader audience might not. Uh, I think government is, is obviously a huge uh, factor in uh, volatility because you have these sort of uh, non-market driven things that impact supply and demand, uh, the ELD mandate, hair follicle testing. Uh, those things are certainly going to have an impact on the availability of truck drivers, how many hours are, are drivers available to haul and so forth. Um, of course, also very similar to that, uh, trade policy and trade balance. Uh, impacts that we've seen just this year uh, with the tariffs that have been implemented is sort of a front run of, of demand and, and freight into the United States, into the ports this summer, and sort of this lull that we're seeing right now, uh, which could go either, either way. It could get really strong, and we have a really strong fourth quarter and really a strong first quarter, or it could fall back. And I think a lot of the economists and analysts are trying to figure out what are we seeing a slowdown in the market due to sort of macroeconomic factors or uh, is this just sort of an irregular uh, element caused by trade policy? And so those things certainly cause volatility in price and demand uh, and capacity. Now, weather has a sort of a short-term impact, unless you're talking about hurricanes, uh, big snowstorms, flooding, fires. All those things will impact weather. Weather are impacted by weather uh, and it will impact trucking. The other thing that you, you have to consider is that weather also drives demand um, and, and drives uh, the demand for trucking services because agriculture producers and farmers um, 
are heavily impacted by weather. They can grow more crops if, I, if conditions are ideal. And therefore, weather can, can create a lot more demand in trucking, uh, but it can also take it away. And so those are things that we keep an eye on and we, we watch. Uh, diesel prices, number of trucks produced, of course, it all goes back to whether we can get the drivers or not. That's a sort of a capacity restriction on what's available. Uh, things that also drive demand are uh, just the, the overall supply of commodities. You know, the oil markets um, uh, have really been, uh, have created a, a lot of demand for U.S. trucking services uh, and have really driven sort of this industrial renaissance that we've seen in the last two years, uh, uh, as well as construction, uh, consumer spending. All of that's going to have an impact on both supply and demand. And because at any moment in time, there's a finite number of trucks and there's a finite number of shipments. When those don't balance, you have volatility. And that's really what's creating this volatility is that irregular matching and geographical irregularity of matching. So I, I mentioned this and I'll, I'll dive into it again, is what do you need to build a liquid futures market? You need a large volatile market. We certainly have talked about uh, the fact that trucking is a large market, but it's also quite volatile. Um, and it's not just volatile on a national basis, but it's volatile on a regional basis. Um, the ports, you know, California uh, sort of has this lull uh, in the first, you know, end of the first quarter going into the second quarter where pricing can be anywhere from 20 to 40% less than what it's in the fourth quarter. That's seasonal, it's consistent. What you never, you can predict the seasonality, you can't predict how far and how high rates can go or how low they can go during the lulls. Um, there's also uh, volatility that happens, sort of macro driven in these markets that are a bit more consistent due to just supply of trucks versus the demand. You need a benchmark index. Um, we believe, in, and a lot of data support this, that DAT is the right benchmark provider for spot rates in the trucking market. And we're very excited about our partnership with DAT. And we also believe that Nodal uh, is the right clearinghouse in exchange for the futures market that we're building. Uh, because we believe that the power market and executive sponsorship are important to support the online market. Uh, and then, of course, our role in the market is to really provide market data, fundamental data, news and commentary about where the trucking market's headed so that companies can, and participants can understand what's really happening, what's, what is driving volatility, uh, and what is likely to drive volatility in the future. Um, uh, about the Trucking Freight Futures Network is one of the things that, that trucking has uh, that's, that's pretty apparent is just the diversity of lanes, origin destination pairs, we call them, or OD pairs, is that um, there are 18,000 OD pairs in the United States, uh, which means um, an OD pair is, in this example, is Seattle to LA is an OD pair. It's an origin Seattle to destination LA. Well, to create a liquid futures market, what you actually need is concentration on specific lanes. You need specific, you need liquidity in specific lanes. And so you can't trade all 18,000 origin destination pairs. So what we did was we said, let's take the high volume lanes, the lanes that are, are really high volume and are uh, largely representative of the U.S. market, um, that you can correlate a lot of the broader market based on the, the demand of these lanes and the liquidity of these lanes. And let's divide up the country and figure out which lanes uh, would be representative of the market. And we came up with these seven lanes represent about 20% of the volume, but more importantly, the direction of movement, directional movement of those particular lanes uh, can move, you can predict any one lane, you can predict about 80% of the market uh, of any particular uh, lane based on the movement of any one of these lanes or, or a lane specifically. And so the idea is that if you have high correlation and you're able to give someone basis uh, coverage on a specific lane, then you can be trading your exposure in another lane where they may be naturally exposed, but actually not trading the lane that they're directly exposed to, just trading one of these benchmark lanes. And so it's important to know that what we've done is we picked out lanes we thought were, were most representative, supported by data, uh, that were re, uh, regionally and geographically, uh, provide regional and geographic coverage, and those are the lanes that we'll be launching futures contracts with. So one of the things, and I, I know that sort of this is review for truckers, but it may not be as obvious, is um, at least as I go out and talk to folks, who are the parties that are naturally exposed to the freight market? 
Um, I could argue that everybody is naturally exposed to it because we ultimately as consumers are paying for prices, but that doesn't really give you comfort. But if we get into specifics, um, we think about trucking companies are naturally exposed to them. And I think, I don't mean to pick on J.B. Hunt, uh, not, no reference there, it's just a photo, so don't get caught up in that. But um, J.B. Hunt and, and the millions of, or the thousands of truckers like it are exposed to directional spot rates. Um, now, the bigger carriers have less exposure in the spot market, the larger car uh, the, the carriers that have more concentration of spot market are gonna be more exposed, but truckload carriers and trucking companies are heavily exposed to directional uh, price. Obviously, the trucking companies naturally want prices to go up, uh, but when prices are volatile, it sort of wreaks havoc on their cash flows. And so they are naturally in the market, in the physical market, they're long. So what happens in the physical market when prices go down, they're naturally exposed to that. That impacts their cash flow and impacts it directly. In the futures market, the way this works is that what they're actually going to do is trade opposite of their natural exposure. So where the market may be going down in terms of price, the way a trucking company would play it is to trade opposite of their exposure. That means that they're hedged. <clears throat> the moment that a trucking company trades equivalent to its exposure, it's actually speculating. And so we would argue that the best practice for trucking companies, people that own trucks, is to actually trade opposite of their exposure. And so who else are exposed? Uh, shippers, people that ship things. Uh, these are auto manufacturers, these are lumber producers, these are corrugated box providers, e-commerce companies, or beverage companies, cereal companies, oil companies, anybody that's producing products and trying to move it from point A to point B, or trying to pay for services to move it from point A to point B, we call shippers. And uh, in the shipping community, there's a substantial amount of them, but they spend a lot of money on freight. And out of that, uh, we, where they're naturally exposed is, you know, shippers naturally want their costs to go down. That's sort of a game, right? Now in the physical market, the goal is I want to mitigate my cost as much as possible. I want to pay the least amount that I possibly can and still enjoy the services that I, I demand from my, my carriers. But I, don't, I want the prices to go down. I want the market conditions to allow for me to save money. I think everybody would, if we're being genuine, uh, genuine would say that that's the natural position of a shipper or a buyer of goods. In the futures market, they're going to trade opposite again, and so they're going to go long. The trucking company that wants prices to go short, uh, the prices to go up, will short the uh, futures market. And a shipper that wants prices to go down in the physical market will actually go long in the futures market. Again, it's all about hedging, which means trading opposite of your natural exposure. And then, of course, we have freight brokers. Um, freight brokers are companies like C.H. Robinson and the 16,000 other freight brokers that are in the marketplace. Um, and what they're wanting is they actually pay both sides. But most of the time, freight brokers, when they're buying capacity, are short of hoping that prices go down because they make money when they set the price, when they sell the capacity to a shipper, and they make their money as prices go down over time. Uh, they're hoping that price, the differential, that, that trucking spot prices have actually gone down, not up at least as long as they have that fixed rate with their shipper. And so that gives them margin expansion. And so their natural position is very similar to what a shipper is, which means they're exposed uh, to prices as they go up because they have to buy the capacity. And so a 3PL, much like a shipper, uh, who is naturally short in the market would actually go long in a futures market. Again, the idea of hedging, we're not speculating, we're not gambling, we're hedging, is that you're trading opposite of your exposure. And so how does one go about trading freight futures? Um, the futures contracts are traded and can be traded on nodal exchange, um, both with the central limit order book and also by bot trades. Um, all of the uh, transactions of nodal exchange are cleared through nodal clear, which is a part of the nodal um, uh, uh, enterprise, a part of of, uh, uh, of the uh, company that, that we partnered with. Um, and they've created this clearinghouse uh, and created a set of tools and, and systems that allow things like portfolio margin limits and position limits 
Uh, and those will be available for uh, the trading, uh, for folks that are trading freight futures. And so what's nice about that is that infrastructure is already built. Now, one of the things that has also come up, and having talked to a lot of venture capitalists about this, uh, and they ask, why didn't you go out and build your own exchange? I, I think I would, I would say it like this is, because we want the market to be liquid, you want to have a marketplace that people are already sort of connected to the global financial markets. And Nodal is already connected to a lot of uh, FCMs and is already connected to the global financial exchanges and the financial markets. And therefore, we are essentially tapping into that marketplace. And so uh, that's what makes it incredibly powerful from a liquidity standpoint, is that we're not having to go organically build liquidity just from the physical market, but we're going to benefit from uh, financial speculators uh, coming into the market to help create the liquidity. So how does one go about becoming a member and trading freight futures? And so this is really important uh, for those that are on the phone that have never traded futures or perhaps are not a member uh, that want to be uh, trading. No one's ever traded freight futures, but if, if you've never gone through the process of setting up an account, this is what you have to do is um, uh, there are uh, what what is called uh, ECPs, which are uh, eligible contract participant standards, um, and they're set by the Commodities Exchange Act, which basically regulates who uh, can and cannot uh, trade. And those are outlined, and we can send those out if you if you request them. We'll make sure that you get a copy of those. Just set a, uh, around standards. Some of it has to do with uh, anti money laundering. A lot of it has to do with just regulatory compliance uh, and, and financial um, uh, elements. Uh, and then also, Nodal Exchange itself has a rule book and a participant agreement that a member will have to adhere to, which says that they will comply with the rules of the exchange, uh, and they have criteria that someone must meet before they're underwritten. And then uh, also, uh, a firm must have an eligible clearing account with one of Nodal Clear's registered FCMs. And we'll give you a list here in a second showing who those FCMs are. So. Let's just make sure that if you've never traded futures, that this is clear is that, um, no pun intended, is that you are not trading on FreightWaves Exchange. You're trading on Nodal's Exchange, but through, think of it as a, a, a broker in your stock, in the stock market, you're going to a broker that's a member of, of the New York Stock Exchange is on the, the, the floor of the National Stock Exchange. And so, and so effectively what you're doing is you're, you're using that as your entrance in there. So if I'm trading a stock, I'm not actually trading directly on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. I'm actually trading through my broker that's then going in and trading those uh, instruments on the exchange itself. It's very similar of how this is set up. And so that's the best way to describe it. So you will need an account with an FCM and we'll, we'll outline who those FCMs are. Um, so what are the membership requirements? Sign the agreement, there's a participant agreement, we can send that out, there's an application, uh, and there's a new account form uh, that's executed by both participant and the FCM. So uh, the FCM will take you on, we'll talk about who those FCMs are, uh, and then you'll want to sign the agreement uh, and send it in and the account will be set up. Now, no one's going to trade until this market's live, which we do have a date. I'm just not at liberty to announce that just yet, but I promise we have a date and we're really excited about it and we will announce it here in a few weeks as to what that date is, uh, but it is coming and it is coming soon. It will be in the first quarter, but we're really excited about that. And so uh, pumped about being able to get this thing liquid. Um, who are the Nodal Clearing members? So we talked about FCMs. These are the firms that you will go to to set up an FCM account that are connected to Nodal. Um, so uh, ADM may be a more household name, if you will, in, in freight just because of the agriculture exposure. Um, and then you have some of the large banks as well as firms that you may know uh, that do some commercial banking. Uh, some of the firms are specifically in futures. Others have a broader banking business. If you have a relationship with one of these banks, that might be the right place to start. If you don't, um, or you kind of get lost in the shuffle and you don't know whom at which bank to contact or, or they, maybe your personal banker doesn't know where to send you, contact uh, our, us at FreightWaves and we're happy to direct you to any one of these firms uh, that can get you set up and, and going. So if you're interested in learning more about the uh, trucking freight futures market uh, and you would love to dive into this, 
Uh, we actually have on-site trading. We partnered with a firm called DTN, which does this uh, at, for really a lot of different commodities. Uh, but specifically, we went to them and said, hey, we really have heard great things about your futures training and energy, and we would love to replicate that in trucking. And so they have set up a whole training and certification program uh, that we have our first class on November 14th. Uh, held in Grapevine, Texas at Market Waves 18. Uh, that's at the Gaylord Texan. Gra Grapevine's a, uh, a, a, a neighborhood outside of uh, Dallas, uh, Fort Worth, right north of the airport. It's about five minutes away from the airport. So we're hosting at the Gaylord Texan. What's really cool about this is um, to really uh, encourage people to come and learn about freight futures. We know sitting in a three-hour class is, you know, maybe not top on your list of the most exciting things to do, but we think it's going to be awesome because you're going to learn something new is we're going to throw in free admission to Market Waves 18 just for going through that certification class, three hours, learn about freight futures, and then you get uh, to be involved in this really kick-ass event that we're putting on over the, those couple of days. So really excited about that. Um, we will send out information where you can sign up for that class. It is in person. Uh, and it is a much more intimate setting than we have here now. Uh, it will be a, a smaller, a small group, but it will be a very powerful group. And uh, we'll be able to dive in and answer questions one on one. So really encourage if you're interested in learning about freight futures to be sure to sign up for that. And we will have ongoing. And so I, I, I'm glad that this slides in here because this is what we are doing at MarketWays. We have Michael Lewis, uh, the renowned author coming got live demos of some really uh, awesome technology companies that are going to be uh, displaying what they're doing and what they're up to. We have some great panel sessions and we have a kick-ass party that's going to be held uh, at the resort as well with a really awesome band and very excited about it. So come to that, learn about futures, get excited about futures, but more fun, but more importantly, have fun at our party uh, and throughout the event. Uh, and that's the Gaylord Texan. And we've got another uh, ad. I think that we're done. So it's it's much more difficult doing a one-on-one -on -one session because you can't play off. So Marianne, my uh, partner in the crime here, uh, I think we have some questions, right? Uh, we have a couple coming through um, just to invite everyone who's on the line. If you have a question, please go ahead and submit that through the Q&A box. Uh, we'll give you just a minute here uh, to go ahead and get those coming. Um, Craig will be happy to answer them. Um, so sit tight for just the next minute and we'll dive right into those. All right, so the first question here, how do you solve the chicken and the egg challenge of shippers linking to the future without financial instruments in place and financial instruments being created without shippers in place? Um, so I, I think what is being asked there, if I, if I understand is how do you, I, I, what I got from that question is how do you create liquidity in an organic market, right? You have this cold start market, is that, I, I'm not reading, is that, is that what it's being asked? Effectively. That's how, that's how I understand. Yeah. So how do you create a liquid market? Well, if you look at these, if you look at successful futures markets versus unsuccessful futures markets, and there have been plenty of both, um, we went back and sort of uh, looked at what drove successful markets and, and created unsuccessful uh, circumstances is one of the most important things that you can do is to create a, uh, to go to the physical market first. And so you need companies that are naturally exposed the price of trucking, in our example, uh, that want and have an interest in trading. And so the reason they're doing this for hedging specifically, they're going to keep the money in to de-risk their exposure to, to spot rates, uh, trucking spot rates, and therefore, uh, they're going to create the initial constructs of the market. And you need both sides. You need both trucking companies uh, that are naturally exposed to prices going down, uh, but you also need shippers that are trying to protect their cash flows. Uh, when prices could potentially go up. And so the idea is that we at FreightWaves and in partnership with DAT and Nodal are starting to identify which firms are most likely exposed uh, to trucking spot rates. And also, and I think this is important, also have a natural understanding of how futures work so that we can get them interested in the market and sort of create that initial organic uh, trade in and out of the market. It will be small. This is not a market that uh, that's going to overnight just explode. You've got to sort of build this fundamental in and out flow of transactions, and we want enough diversity and trades to sort of build the underlying market. And so we're playing the long game, and we're, we're hoping that this builds up over time, and that's our goal. And so we're looking at a lot of diversity on both sides of the, of the transaction. Right. 
And then what is the amount of spot rates in the US FTL market versus fixed contract rates? Yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, and I would answer it this way, is that if, if you look at the US trucking market, 700 billion, it's sort of misleading because that 700 billion is a derived number. Uh, if you look at the four higher markets, so take out the privately uh, held trucking market, that, so say the p people like Walmart that own their own fleets or Frito Lay or et cetera, et cetera. Um, 350 billion. So we're down about 400 billion in the four higher market. And four higher means someone's buying capacity in the marketplace from a company that's in the business of providing trucking services. And so that's the 400 billion. So take the entire private fleet out of it. We're about 400 billion. And then we have to figure out how big the spot market. And so I actually break up the trucking market between what I call truly, truly spot, which is sort of universally recognized as not having a rate agreed ahead of time and really within a very short time, let's say within seven days, most often within 48 hours, I've got a truck, uh, I've got a load and I need to move it now and I'm looking for a price at that moment in time. And so uh, you can argue that's, that's anywhere from 15 to 30%, I think it's probably closer to that 30% number of spot. Uh, and again, the larger companies are gonna have less exposure to that, but um, across the marketplace, let's say it's a third. Uh, and so when we, when we think about that, that's about $130 billion that are in that true spot market. Now, there's another element of this, which is not commonly thought of, is what we like to call implied spot market, which is, it's technically contracted because the rates were submitted in an RFP months, if not a year before, but it's not being consistently honored, either by the shipper is not consistently using that carrier on that lane, or either by the trucking company that's not taking freight from that shipper when alternatives are more desirable. And so because of that, it's a contract rate, it's thought of and treated in the market as a contract rate, but will move the, the execution of those transactions will move based on the availability of the trucking market. And that's probably 40% of the entire market is in that in waterfall or uh, uh, TMS system that's sort of very volatile inside of a company's system. They may not think they're buying on the spot market, but the lowest price carrier may be 25% uh, less than the guy that's number four or number five in that routing guide. And so that's sort of, sort of an implied market. And so when we think of the size of the futures market, what we've gone out and said, uh, we think sort of that initial market that's interesting is the $80 billion of what is truly spot. And we think once the market sort of is, is at a point of liquidity and the market's transparent, then you can move upstream into sort of that implied spot market. Uh, the contract market probably will never change. Now, this is not dissimilar than other markets. Other commodities have set price and a contract price, and only a very small portion of it moves in spot. Uh, 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 and therefore, but it still sets the price because that's what ends up moving over time. <clears throat> and then are the futures designed for a specific trailer type? Ah, uh, great question. I'm glad you've asked me this question. So uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we are not talking LTL trucking. Um, LTL is, is what people think of as uh, pallets and boxes in the LTL business. So companies like XPO and FedEx and UPS are commonly referred to either as parcel or LTL carriers, and they do both. Um, and so um, we're not talking about that type of the business. And initially, we're not talking about flatbed or refrigerated. What we're talking about is the 75% of the trucking market, which is in the 53-foot over-the-road van trailer. That's about 75% of the four higher spot, uh, spot market is in that market. So we're not initially rolling out flatbed and we're not rolling out refrigerated. We're rolling out the dry, uh, dry van uh, uh, spot market, which are 53 foot trailers. So we're not trading container, uh, container boxes, uh, or at least capacity related container boxes. We are trading the over the road 53 foot van trailers. Okay, great. And will there be option contracts? That's a great question. You have to get an options market, you have to have a liquid futures market. And so options will come in time. Um, I think uh, over time, uh, that will be something that will be addressed, but it, it is not something that you will see day one. And our, and our hope and anticipation is that the market um, over the next 12 months become, after 12 months of launch, becomes liquid enough to support options contracts. Uh, but uh, we, um, that's about as far as I can go into that. Okay, great. 
and what are you able to provide any info on what a standard contract size would be? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that as well. Um, and I think it may be the appendix, but I, 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 I will we'll stay away from opening this up. So it's not my computer. Um, it, there is a uh, standard contract. Um, let's see. No, it's not on here. Um, it, there is a standard contract, which we will provide. We have already uh, created the contract, so we, uh, you can actually see it. Um, the thing that I would say is um, uh, the contracts are 1,000-mile uh, lots. Um, so regardless of what lane, if you remember that lane map that I showed uh, where you had Seattle to L.A., L.A. and Dallas, Atlanta, Philadelphia, Chicago, et cetera, uh, those lanes are obviously not 1,000 miles exactly, uh, and some of them are larger than 1,000 miles, and some of them are shorter. But to create consistency in the market, these, again, are financially settled. There is no truck that will ever show up. They're financially settled, and so we're doing 1,000 miles on each contract based on DAT's spot rate. So whatever the lane uh, price is on that, uh, or whatever the rate, the DAT spot rate that's assessed on that particular lane, uh, times a thousand miles will be the size of the contract. So, for instance, um, I believe the last time I, I looked at the uh, LA to Dallas lane, uh, it was uh, trading at about a dollar ninety-two, and this was a, maybe a week ago or so. Uh, at a dollar ninety-two, multiply one uh, one point nine two times a thousand, and that would tell you sort of the size of the contract. Okay, great. And we've got one more here, so feel free to keep them coming if you've got them. We'll wrap up here in the next few minutes, if not. Is the fuel included in the DAT indices, and are they the same indices as rate view? Ah, great question. Um, I, I no, these are, and the answer on both of them is no. Uh, fuel is net of uh, the so line haul is what we're focused on here. Uh, fuel is actually taken away, uh, out of the assessed uh, price and the, the futures contract. Um, we're certainly looking at fuel, and we may have something to update there. Um, uh, but but today it's all. Uh, uh, the DAT spot rate. Um, it is derived from the same data set that they build rate view, uh, although it's slightly different. And there are some differences related to um, uh, the, uh, the specific uh, methodologies on how those rates for, were given in terms of what is included in those rates. Um, what makes sense for the physical market um, may be slightly different than what makes sense for the futures market. And so we are, all those are disclosed in the contracts that you'll see, uh, but they're going to be pulling from the same data set. They'll be slightly different in terms of price uh, and slightly different in terms of methodology, but certainly from the same assessment uh, um, element. Awesome. Well, that is everything that we have today. Um, so thanks so much, Craig, for being here and answering these questions. Thanks to those of you in the audience for bearing with us through the technical difficulties <laughs> if you joined us earlier in the week. Um, and once again, a reminder just to join us at Market Waves 18 if you've not already gotten your tickets. That will be here in the next couple of weeks, November 12th and 13th. And as Craig mentioned, those who sign up for the futures training session, which will take place Wednesday, November 14th from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Central Time, will get a free ticket to Market Waves. That is a almost $2,500 value. So big, big value in it for you if you decide to join us. And it's also, if you're interested in freight, and regardless of whether you think futures are right for you, and, and look, I think, frankly, you have, to, you have to answer that question before you go and trade it. Um, if you think it's right for you, it's, great, it's a great place to come and, and explore it and, and learn about it. And it's free. You, know, you get the whole thing for free. And so really excited about it. We will put out a lot more information. Uh, this is the first time we've done a public uh, a webinar related to freight futures. Uh, so there'll be a lot more information. We know this is really high level. And we recognize that uh, those that have sort of studied futures, uh, that everyone's sort of at a different place in terms of their understanding. Uh, and so we will have uh, different uh, webinars related to sort of the depth of understanding. And so uh, we're playing the long game. We'll continue to build education. And uh, really excited that you joined us. And, and I'll reiterate what Marianne said. We're apologized about the technical difficulties. Uh, but luckily, I think today we, we survived it. So. Yeah, made it through a little better this time. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, and we hope to see you in the next couple of weeks at Market Wave. All right, thank you.